Bonjour. Good afternoon. Je m'appelle Marc Garneau. Uh, my name is Marc Garneau, and uh, I'm going to be the master of ceremonies today. C'est moi qui euh, va décider qui va poser les questions. Alors, quand on va arriver à la période des questions, si vous avez une question, levez la main. Si je pointe euh, vers vous, c'est vous qui allez poser la question. Uh, you can ask your question in French or in English. Uh, if you have a question, when we get to the question period, just, just uh, put up your hand, and if I point to you, you'll be the one that will be uh, asking the question. I think there are microphones that uh, are there. Perfect. All right, so I think we're ready to receive uh, the rest of our guests here. Starting with uh, somebody that uh, is very much involved as the head of, uh, of the uh, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Ministry, but also responsible for the Canadian Space Agency, the Honorable Navdeep Baines. Thank you. And then uh, followed by Jeremy Hansen, who is one of the astronauts. You may have recognized him uh, from the way he's dressed. Followed by Jenny Seide, another one of the astronauts. And finally, by somebody I'm sure you all recognize, the Prime Minister of Canada, the Premier Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Uh, merci, Marc. Merci, tout le monde. It's a great pleasure to voir ici. Uh, surtout que vous êtes de l'école Centennial. Uh, vous ne savez peut-être pas, uh, et j'ai des collègues probablement qui ne le savent pas, mais moi j'ai eu mes premières expériences en tant qu'enseignant à Centennial. I was studying at McGill in education and I was a student teacher at Centennial a whole bunch of years ago. So I, I know the school well and it's great to see you all and what you've, uh, what you've come. I'm also, as I think about it, uh, really touched uh, by you being here today because when I yeah, we just made a big announcement on space, and I'm always really excited about that. And I've been super interested and excited in space and science all my life. And if I have to think back to that moment where I first got interested in space and in science, when I was 12 years old, an astronaut came to my school. And it was 1984. Uh, and it was some sort of, it, it was like a picnic lunch thing where uh, people got to bid on eating with this astronaut. And it was a super exciting thing. And it was actually Canada's first astronaut. And that was the moment I got to meet Mark Garneau. <laughs> I was 12 years old. Uh, and, and to be able to work with him now uh, in government and be part of uh, decisions like this one today is, uh, is really, really important and really exciting as well. So uh, it all comes full circle, but for me, an opportunity to draw in your interest in space, to make you interested in what we are doing is really exciting. And today is a particular exciting day because we just made a big announcement about Canada's uh, uh, involvement in the Lunar Gateway Project. We just announced a new space strategy centered on our participation in the Lunar Gateway, which is a new international space station that will orbit the moon. Now, you'll know the International Space Station has been there for about 20 years now, uh, and it's been involved and been responsible for huge advances in science and understanding and learning, but it's reaching sort of the end of uh, its useful time as a real generator of innovative, cutting-edge scientific discoveries. And we need to push for, I mean, there's still lots more to do, but we want to keep pushing these frontiers. Puis la prochaine étape, c'est d'établir une station uh, scientifique uh, autour de la Lune. Et le Canada a été demandé par nos partenaires à travers le monde, la NASA et d'autres, de participer parce que les Canadiens ont toujours fait partie des grandes innovations au niveau de la Lune, euh, au niveau de, de l'espace, que ce soit le Canada Arm, euh, que ce soit nos astronautes, que ce soit nos scientifiques, nos chercheurs, que ce soit la robotique, et encore plus, l'intelligence artificielle. Parce que la grande différence entre avoir une station autour de la Lune et avoir une station autour de la Terre, c'est que les distances impliquées nous empêchent d'avoir des communications assez instantané pour pouvoir contrôler les robots, les bras, euh, les machines qu'il va avoir sur cette station de la Terre. Alors, il va falloir qu'on ait des ordinateurs et des intelligences artificielles assez sophistiquées pour pouvoir euh, gérer sans l'intervention humaine 
sur cette, euh, sur cette station, surtout que c'est une station qui ne sera pas occupée de façon continue par des êtres humains. Alors, le Canada a un rôle très, très important à jouer et c'est exactement euh, la grande nouvelle qu'on a annoncée aujourd'hui, ce qui est très, très excitant. Mais là, c'est un projet qui va s'étendre sur les, prochains, les prochaines décennies et à cause de ça, on a besoin que des jeunes à travers le pays commencent à s'intéresser de plus en plus à l'espace, à la science, à la technologie, à voir des carrières que vous allez pouvoir avoir pour nous aider dans cinq ans, dans dix ans, dans vingt ans, avec ces, ces, ces innovations et ces découvertes. Alors, on a créé un programme pour les jeunes astronautes ou les futurs astronautes, pour tous les jeunes Canadiens et toutes les jeunes Canadiennes, d'un océan à l'autre, de la maternelle à la douzième année. Il y a trois types d'activités qui pourraient intéresser les étudiants qui vont se dérouler cet automne euh, et qui vont vous permettre des, des opportunités de développer vos capacités, vos connaissances, votre compréhension et découvrir à quel point ça pourrait vous intéresser comme carrière, comme avenir. Alors, the three streams of activities we're going to be putting forward. First stream, science and technology, which focuses on science and innovation and the need that are needed for lunar missions. It includes online activities like operating rover simulators and using coding to study the impacts of space on the human body. The second stream is around physical fitness, where we'll focus on fitness, but also on the kind of nutrition and health, need, health issues needed for long space missions. We know if we're ever going to make it to Mars, we have to do a lot better at jobs understanding the impact on the human body uh, and how we're going to survive extended periods of weightlessness to be able to actually uh, thrive in those situations. So this fall, you could go through activities that would mimic those used to test future astronauts, like endurance and strength exercises, and see what it feels like to work in a spacesuit. And uh, the third stream would be around leadership and communication, where you'll learn how to work with a team, solve problems as a group, and take on big questions. And then uh, in the fall, we'll organize a big Brain Hacks, which is a marathon-like digital campaign that will include talks from astronauts and space uh, experts. So all this is designed to get young people right across the country as excited as I am, as we are, about Canada's future as part of the international space exploration. And that means uh, that we're going to be drawing you in through this, uh, through various contests. Uh, vos écoles, vos organismes vont prendre part aux activités. Ils vont pouvoir uh, recevoir une visite d'un astronaute. Uh, vous auriez peut-être pouvoir organiser uh, la, une chance de sélectionner des jeunes astronautes d'à travers le pays pour venir ici à Saint-Hubert uh, pour vivre des expériences de camp uh, de jeunes <coughs> astronautes. So uh, the real, the winners of the contest could get real opportunities to do simulations around Canada Arm, around virtual reality simulations of the space, uh, space uh, exploration or the, the uh, space station, and also uh, practice driving remote control rovers and things like that. So there's lots of things, lots of exciting things, and mostly there's a big piece of the future that's going to be wrapped up in science, technology, engineering, and math, and how we engage young people across this country in getting uh, excited about it, getting interested in it, and mostly seeing yourselves in this future is what uh, this day is all about and why I'm so looking forward to hearing from all of you, to hearing all the great questions I know that you're going to have for Jeremy and Jenny uh, and maybe for Mark and maybe even for me. Uh, we, uh, this is an opportunity, and yes, and maybe for and, the minister as well. I, um, <laughs> but your opportunity to ask questions uh, that have come in from the room and around the, and around the country is what I'm really excited about. So I can't wait to hear from you all, but mostly, Thank you all for being here today. It's un grand plaisir de vous voir tout le monde. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister, for, uh, for those words of introduction and for setting the table. And as you said, we're here in a town hall. On est ici pour répondre à vos questions. Je sais que vous avez tous pensé à des questions que vous allez pouvoir demander uh, à tous mes collègues ici qui sont uh, réunis. Et puis j'ai hâte de vous entendre. I'm looking forward to hearing you, and I want to make sure that the people behind me know that je vais vous regarder de temps en temps pour savoir si vous avez des questions. Mais euh, sans plus tarder, euh, est-ce qu'il y en a qui ont des questions? Levez la main, ne soyez pas gênés. Vous. Alors, euh, est-ce qu'on peut vous donner oui, un micro? Juste là. Oui. Hi, 
Yeah, good question. Well, I wanted to become an astronaut because I saw someone else become an astronaut. I um, was only a couple years old when um, Roberta Bondar, who's Canada's first female astronaut and a colleague of um, Mark Garneau's, flew on her mission. And I, I was, I mean, I was much younger than you guys, like I said, but I don't remember all the details of that, but I remember my mom said it was really important. It was really important that we paid attention, and we had news clippings from her mission. I still have a scrapbook that I made with her. I have a little rocket that I made, and really that's what sparked my interest in exploring space. So it was because of her and the, the other uh, like amazing astronauts that we've had in Canada who have really paved that way. So I was inspired by them, um, and I had a, a chance to see her speak later on, and that really did it for me. I, got, I was interested in exploring other types of science, and eventually I became interested in fire. That's what I studied. But then I came back to being an astronaut. That's what inspired me. Jeremy, how about you? Uh, for me, I, I started out really interested in aviation. And uh, we had these things called encyclopedias when I was a kid. And they were, they were books. It's they like had. Google in books. Yeah, it's exactly like Google. And in, in Encyclopedia A was the airplane section. I spent a lot of time flipping through it. And one day, I missed a page, and I came across Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, the first human to walk on the moon. And, uh, and I was like, wow, that's really crazy. Uh, humans went to the moon and came back. And then the next time I walked outside my farmhouse and looked up at the moon, I realized that right where I was looking, there were boot prints there. And I thought, that is crazy. And that just opened up my mind to what's possible. And nobody told me I couldn't be an astronaut, so I just assumed I could. And then I saw mentors that went before me, like Roberta and Mark and the others. And I just saw Canadian astronauts going to space. And so I just assumed that I could do that too. And I started checking out space books from the library and reading about space. And people would ask me what I wanted to do. And I'd say, well, I want to fly airplanes and I want to fly in space. And I just never stopped. And eventually I learned you know, how hard it was going to be and how unlikely it would be that I would achieve that goal. But because I did one important thing I want to share with you. I shared my dream with others. I told them what my goal was. I set this goal, and I shared it with others. And when I hit those points that I didn't believe I was going to be an astronaut, it was the people around me that told me, you can, and I'm going to help you get there. My parents, my teachers, my mentors, the Air Cadet program. And so that's what I would share with you is set goals. That's actually what this team here did today. We set a huge goal. Not for me, not for Jenny, for Canada. We set a big goal, actually, for the world. And we're going to chase that goal. And you can be a part of that. And you can t pick your other goal, any goal, anything that interests you. So today's, today's a pretty meaningful day for us. Merci, Jeremy. Alors, on va prendre une autre question. Voilà. Allez-y. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I've always been wondering, how much does it cost to make one rocket? OK, does anybody want to take that question? Well, I will, I'll let you do it if you're ready, Minister. Well, so I can't speak to the rocket specifically, <laughs> but I think today's announcement uh, is important to highlight how much money we are investing. Uh, it is a big deal, and the Prime Minister knows this because there's competing interests and priorities. We're focusing on investing in health care. We're focusing on education and other key priorities. And so how do you reconcile such a big investment? So today's announcement to the Lunar Gateway Project is two billion dollars uh, and so that'll help us make you know Canada arm three there's two components to it a large arm and a small arm so it's a lot of money um, and uh, this is a 24-year commitment so this arm is not going to be built overnight and it's going to see benefits for years and decades down the road so it's very very exciting so it's a lot of money but it's worth it um, if I may very quickly give the analogy uh, where we have incredible astronauts here right um, and not everyone's going to be an astronaut uh, you should have goals. Uh, you should set yourself up for success. But there's a lot of people behind the scenes that play a critical role. And we were talking about this. There's people that actually design the robots that the astronauts will use. There's people that help you train. Uh, there's people that develop policy. The prime minister, for example, said, here's the goal we're going to set. Here's what the policy looks like. So you can actually make a difference in space by even being involved in politics. So the point is there's so many different ways to have a positive impact to pursue your dreams. So that's a message I think is really important uh, and that I'd share with you. But bottom line is a lot of money, and, and the prime minister and his government made that commitment, set that goal that's going to benefit you and many other Canadians uh, for years to come. Thank you. 
you. Well, yeah. thank you. And, uh, and you know, not a lot of Canadians know about it, but Canada did actually build rockets. Uh, there are two kinds of rockets. There's rockets that go into space and they go around the Earth or go on beyond that. Or there are rockets that are called suborbital. They go up and they come down right away. And they're up there in space for about 15 minutes. And Canada built what's known as the Black Brant rocket. We built over a thousand of them. And we actually launched these out of Churchill, Manitoba. And uh, so Canada does have a rocket history, not the orbital rockets, but the suborbital rockets. Alors, votre question. I have a bit of a off-topic question for, ju for Justin Trudeau. Is it okay if I ask one of those? Go ahead. Uh, America has been going through a lot of controversy lately, and it's just sometimes referred back to Canada. What is your opinion on that? Um, look, uh, you know, th there's no question that, that as you look in the news today, uh, as you look at, at the news around the world, there's a lot of things uh, that are going through conflicts and changes and transformation. Um, and countries are making different decisions about it. Uh, and my responsibility is to try and make sure that Canada makes the right decisions and, and prepares for the future in the best possible way. Um, a lot of people are choosing to uh, close down their borders. A lot of people are choosing to turn inwards. I think Canadians always do best when we are engaging with the world, when we stay open, when we bring in people from all around the world, when we work together with people all around the world to solve big problems. Uh, and that's something that's not as common around the world as it used to be or as it should be in the future. I think the space program is a great example of where countries come together. I mean, right now you can look at the news and you can see you know, Russia and the United States um, you know, arguing and disagreeing about a whole bunch of different things. Except when it comes to the space program, uh, Russian astronauts and Canadian astronauts and American astronauts work very closely together. Perfect example right now uh, is right now David Saint-Jacques, uh, our Canadian astronaut, is up in the International Space Station with two crew members that he works with every single day, gets along really well with, uh, an American and a Russian. Uh, and that idea of having ways in which we can come together beyond uh, the little disagreements on the ground that sometimes seem very big uh, is really, really important for all of us. So one of the things that Canada is I think stepping up a little bit on in the world right now is trying to make sure that people are thinking about longer term solutions, trying to be reasonable about bringing people together, standing very, very strongly in our values and our principles, but making sure that we're focused on what's really going to matter 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. And that's one of the reasons why the space program and, and, and the opportunity to think really big and set goals that are going to take 24 years of work uh, into the future and a lot of collaboration across uh, you know, nations of the world is the kinds of things uh, that I'm going to continue to, to push for and continue uh, to believe in. And quite frankly, I know all of you are going to be pushing on. Thank you, Prime Thank you Minister. I'm sure there's a question over there. I can't see the person, but you're, yes, your, your question. Um, for the astronauts, what's the most beautiful thing you've seen in space? Well, there's only one astronaut up here that's been in space. <laughs> So. Okay, well, uh, without any hesitation, planet Earth. Uh, the chance to look down upon our planet and to see that this uh, is where all of humanity uh, lives, uh, where 200 countries exist, where 7.5 billion people live, and it's surrounded by the darkness of space, the realization that this is our home, this beautiful, this beautiful a planet uh, in the middle of, of a solar system, in the middle of a huge universe, and the realization that we need to take care of it because we only have this home, that we have a fragile environment, uh, a fragile atmosphere that we have to take care of, oceans that we have to take care of. Those are the things that uh, you realize when you go up in space and you spend all of your time when you're not busy doing your work looking down at our beautiful planet. I just want to ask, how many of you would like to see that with your own eyes? Yeah, all right. Go. Yeah. And you know, I, this takes me back. You asked how much rockets cost. <laughs> um, something you really ought to know is that that's, that price is going down 
all the time now. How many of you have seen a rocket take off and land? Have you seen that on, on TV or on a computer, a YouTube video? SpaceX rocket? Is that not the most incredible thing? I, I don't know if you realize that. Like, that is brand new. That never used to happen, and now it's happening all the time. And that means that the cost of building rockets is going down. And if the cost is going down, are we going to do more or are we going to do less? More. A lot more. And that's why this matters to you. That's why this country set these goals for you, because your future will be impacted by the changes that are happening in the space industry. There's going to be more space jobs. There's going to be more astronauts, more engineers, more scientists in space. How many of you, one more question, sorry, boss, but uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. How many of you want to work in the space industry when you're done your schooling? Our interest would be scientists, engineers, learn things, find solutions for our planet, bring them back. Yeah, this that's is awesome. Uh, very encouraging, uh, yes, absolutely. Our recruitment's paying off. The girl with the, <laughs> with the glasses. The Your turn. <laughs> Um, I was uh, I was raised obviously uh, with a dad who was prime minister. My father was prime minister from uh, 1968 uh, to 1984, and I was around for the last 13 years of that. So I got to see, um, yes, how hard he worked and 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 you know what he did, but I also got to see people walking up to him all the time while he was prime minister, but also after, um, saying thank you, thank you for. Uh, serving our country. Thank you for making a difference in my life. Thank you for uh, helping uh, my parents or my grandparents come to this country. H thank you for what you did to make this country a better place, whether it was standing up for official bilingualism or uh, creating multiculturalism or moving forward with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He did a lot of really big things. And I learned growing up that what mattered was having a positive impact in the world. And I knew that, you know, not everyone was going to become prime minister, and I didn't think that I would become prime minister, but I knew that whatever it is that I tried to do, I would have to try and make a difference. And there are so many different ways of making a difference. You can be uh, an astronaut. Uh, you can be a politician. Uh, you can be a teacher. And that was what my choice was. Uh, that's why I went to McGill to study education. Uh, that's why I was uh, at Centennial doing a student teacher's uh, uh, experience uh, many years ago. That's why I moved uh, out to Vancouver and actually uh, started working as a teacher for a number of years. And for me, that was my way of having the biggest impact I could in the world. And that's the challenge that we all face. How can you do the best you can to make your neighborhood, your community, your city, your country better with the skills you have, whatever they are? Uh, and then after I'd taught for many years and I'd got into, uh, for a number of years and got into uh, doing a lot of public speaking and advocacy and activism on protecting our environment and getting more young people involved in, in shaping their world, I realized that actually I was actually pretty good at politics too and that would be something that I wanted to do. But it didn't start with saying, oh, I want to be prime minister. It started by saying, I want to make a difference. And that question of, how I can best make a difference is something that we all have to figure out. And not you know one time you figure it out and then you're set. You figure it out constantly, whether you're you know, an astronaut uh, or a politician uh, or whatever it is you do, or a teacher or a lawyer or, a, or, or, or yeah, anyone who works anywhere. You're always trying to do more to have a better impact in the world. And it was that thinking and that approach that you define yourself and your success, not by what you get from the world, but by what you have to offer the world. That's what makes you relevant. That what's makes, that's what makes you successful. That's where we need, as a society, as a world, to try and expose you and encourage you to push yourselves in as many different ways as possible. I mean, the thing that's different between Jenny and Jeremy and, and between every astronaut you'll ever meet is they all have totally different paths to getting to it. Um, you know, some could be interested in fire, others in flying, others in, 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 in you know, different approaches. Um, and whatever you're pushing, wherever you're going, you're going to end up somewhere interesting if you end up true to yourself and keep focusing on how can I make the biggest difference possible. That's what drove me to where I am, and that's hopefully what will drive you to the amazing heights you're each going to reach throughout your lives. 
Merci, Premier ministre. Alors, nous avons aussi reçu des questions euh, d'écoles des, euh, qui euh, ont envoyé les questions, et celle-ci va être pour Jenny. Jenny, uh, here's a question from Shaza Katab, who is in grade four at Chibucto Heights School in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And her question is, how much time does it take to get to the moon? Oh, that is a great question. Well, the Apollo astronauts who did go to the moon, I think it took them around three days. So it takes a couple days to get to the moon. Um, but is it, I, I mean, that's a pretty short trip, like three days. You can, you can imagine going to the moon and then <laughs> hanging out there a bit and coming back, right? That's not that far. But the preparation to actually get there, you got to put in a lot of work. I mean, the amount of training that we do to prepare for a mission, for a flight, no matter where we're going, whether we're going to the International Space Station, 400 kilometers above the surface of our Earth, that's where David St. Jacques is right now, or whether we're going a quarter of a million miles away to the moon, that that's a road is a really long one. But once you're up, three days to get to the moon, three days to get back. Uh, th that actually reminds me, when I was explaining yesterday to my daughter Ella, who's here, uh, this announcement, uh, what we were doing, say hi Ella, give a wave, there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, I, was, I was explaining to her uh, that you know the lunar gateway, it's around the moon, it's really important, but we need the AIs and the robots because uh, it takes three days to get to the moon, and therefore you have to you, know, you have to be able to control it at distance and control it autonomously. Um, and then I sort of kept talking about that. And so this is the big announcement we're making. It's really exciting. She says, "Okay, well." That means we'll be on the moon by the weekend then. Because <laughs> three days to get to the moon. I said, no, it's a 24-year program. Uh, it'll be a, a few years before we get there. But the actual travel time, as you say, uh, once we get to that point, should be two or three days. Very good. Question back here. All right. Uh, young man in the gray sweater. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think Canada will be like in 100 years? Hmm. That's your job. Uh, you know, it'd be my job, uh, and what I hope uh, is that the decisions we're making today, the decisions you'll be making uh, today, tomorrow, and for the next decades, will always set us on a path uh, that does a few things. Uh, that figures out, first of all, how to give everyone, regardless of where they're born, what their background is, what community they're part of, the best possible chance to succeed and to fulfill their potential. I think Canada needs to be a fair country, and being a fair country means no matter where you're born, no matter what your identity, no matter what your background, no matter what language you speak, you get to have every opportunity to succeed to your fullest. And I think 100 years from now, uh, we should be even better than we are today. And right now, we're one of the fairest countries in the world. We're one of the places that uh, understands best that differences are always a sure source of strength and resilience, but there's still work to do. I think 100 years from now, we will have figured out that you can't make a choice between protecting our environment and growing our economy and making good jobs and making sure that everyone has enough food on the table. That the only way to make sure that we're doing that the right way is to make sure that the jobs we have and the growth we create is also sustaining and protecting the environment. And the things we do to protect and sustain our environment also creates better jobs and better opportunity. That those things aren't separate anymore. I think that's something we're really going to need to see. And the final thing really is about you know, how we start to recognize the value intrinsic in every single person. I think a lot of the 20th century was a fight for recognizing the basic and fundamental rights of every person. And I think the 21st century needs to be really focused on recognizing the value, the, the potential, um, the importance of supporting and protecting every single person and allowing them to contribute fully to uh, making their community and their world a better place. So those are the kinds of things uh, that I'm certainly trying to uh, make sure we head in that direction, but a lot more people are going to have to keep working on that over the coming decades uh, to make sure we end up at the right place 100 years from now. Thank you for yeah. your question. So we have a question from this young man uh, in, the, in the purple. Uh, uh, this is kind of like a weird question, but do you guys believe in like life, maybe not like in our solar system, but maybe somewhere else in the universe? That's a good question. I think we should ask the minister of... Uh, no, no, let's, uh, let's ask the astronauts <laughs> that one. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. <laughs> well, I wanted to hear it. No, no, after you, I'll follow you. <laughs> um, so 
We don't know. So it's a great question. I love the way you framed it. We don't see evidence visiting us right now. Astronauts, my, my colleagues go to space and come back. They don't talk about meeting or seeing uh, UFOs in space. As a fighter pilot, I was on alert to go intercept unidentified objects above our country. And I kind of thought, you know, maybe now that I have a top secret clearance, I'm going to get pulled into a room and they're going to tell me about this, like X Files, if you know what that show is. <laughs> and it just didn't happen. So I don't believe we're being visited by aliens today. I've never seen any evidence. But the universe is enormous. When I started this job years ago, we believed the universe um, had a couple billion galaxies in it. What, what galaxy do we live in? Milky Way. Milky Way. And we think our galaxy, it has roughly 100, 200 billion stars. Who count, who's counting? It's a lot. But we think there's, we, we used to think there was 200 billion of those in the universe. And now we, we know there's more than over a trillion of them. And that's just in the last few years. So the universe is it's unimaginable. And to imagine that there's no life out there somewhere is hard to believe. So it seems most likely there is life somewhere. And here's something else. If you wanted to look, let's say in our closest galaxy, the n closest neighboring galaxy, let's say there was a really advanced civilization there, and they had this incredible telescope, and they were looking at planet Earth, what would they see? They would see us 200,000 years ago. Are we here? We're not here. So if there's somebody right now looking at Earth from the nearest galaxy, they don't even see us. They don't even see humans on this planet yet. And so that gives you some perspective of how hard it is to look for life in the entire universe. And we just haven't found it yet. But we should keep looking. Yeah, I agree with Jeremy. <laughs> that was your answer. He just got to it first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Alors, je sais que tout le monde parle français ici. Je veux savoir si quelqu'un a une question en français. Qui veut poser une question en français? Voilà. Um, C'était quoi la partie la plus difficile du uh, training pour être un astronaute? Je peux le faire. Um, pour moi, j'ai trouvé uh, l'entraînement pour une sortie extravehiculaire. C'est l'entraînement le, le plus difficile. C'est parce qu'on fait ça dans une grande piscine, par exemple. Um, et vous êtes dans un uh, gros, uh, gros scaphandre. Et c'est vraiment difficile de faire les choses normales dans le scaphandre comme ça. Ça prend de puissance. On fait beaucoup d'entraînement au gymnase pour faire ça. Et aussi, on fait, or, ça prend uh, d'intelligence de créer une solution pour faire toutes les choses. Alors, c'est comme, fait, comme uh, te, te prie un examen. Uh, au-dessus de la l'eau quand tu fais l'entraînement. Et uh, le ministre, ils ont fait des, uh, des sorties extravehiculaires. Moi, je n'en ai pas fait, mais je suis d'accord <laughs> avec toi que le travail dans la piscine euh, pendant six heures ouais. de temps, oui. c'est très fatigant, c'est très exigeant. Et comme tu dis, il faut trouver des solutions pour des problèmes euh, inattendus. Alors, oui, tu as raison, je crois. Uh, you, sir. Um, what is it uh, like being in space? So I guess I'll have to answer that one. But uh, um, I tell people that space is uh, an extraordinary experience for two reasons. One is because, as I mentioned before, you get to see Earth. And it is a perspective that very few people have had to see our planet uh, from above and to think about the issues uh, that are important for us as a human species. Uh, you are no longer thinking about the little things that bothered you before. You're thinking about the big issues. The second part that I love about it is being able to float. And, uh, you know, I'm a grown up, serious adult, and all of the astronauts are grown up, serious adults, and we're on very expensive missions in space. <laughs> And there's a lot riding on the success of our mission. But when you arrive up there after a pretty rock and roll launch and you realize that you are floating and it is quiet um, and that you can just float out of your seat, which I'm sure all of you would like to be able to do, uh, there is something that comes back that you lost when you grew up, and that is your imagination. You all still have imaginations, but as you grow up and you become a serious adult and you have to deal with all sorts of serious things, 
you tend to lose a little bit that magic uh, imagination that you had when you were a child and everything was possible. And when you're up there, you feel that you are rediscovering that imagination that uh, faded away as you became an adult. And, uh, and you have a big smile on your face all the time because it is such an extraordinary place. So floating and seeing Earth are really the two things that I remember the most. Thank you. Okay, here's a question. Uh, this one's for Jenny, and it's from Xavier from grade 9 at Léo Rimiard School in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Is it really possible to colonize Mars? Can humans really grow food, live, raise families, and one day even breathe air? That's a big question, but uh, we'll give it to you, Jenny. I think, I mean, absolutely. I, we're, we're working towards these long-term goals. So the capabilities that were in that question, I mean, that sounds pretty amazing, being able to colonize Mars, even to send humans to Mars, uh, to be able to colonize the moon, those sort of big ideas. There are so many challenges there, but I believe absolutely if it's something that we say that we want to do, we'll be able to do it. And the reason why I think that um, in space exploration, these things are possible is because really you just have to look at what we've, what we've done so far. I mean, if I, if I really think about what going to the moon was and what going back will be, think about what we did. We, we built a rocket ship and it's, imagine it's as tall as a skyscraper. You can go see these rocket ships, the Saturn V. We assembled it so carefully with the precision of a watch. We accelerated it to the speed of a bullet. We sent it a quarter of a million miles away to the moon, and we brought everybody back. And we did that over and over again. Humans did that. That is incredible. And really what that did for the world is it changed what we thought was possible. People thought we couldn't do that. I got that question before about how, how long does it take to get to the moon? Even just looking at it, how many people do you think wondered, how long would it take to get to the moon before we did it? And then we did it. That's absolutely unreal. So that the idea of space exploration is not, can we do these things? It's if we set those goals, we will be able to do them. And it's the problem solving that's going to take us there. And the, the ingenuity and the technology and the inspiration that comes from that is what is really incredible. But as far as plans for, for the moon and being able to colonize someplace like Mars, like grow food, those are the problems that we are working on right now. And that's what Canada wants to invest in. That's what we're going to do. So yeah, I think we'll do it. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, you have your hand up. Yes, go ahead. Vas-y. Oops. Uh, let's say the Earth exploded. <laughs> would, uh, would the uh, moon lose its orbit? OK, very good question. Uh, Prime Minister, I think you, you <laughs> want to answer that well, one. <laughs> OK. <laughs> For, uh, the moon uh, orbits around planet Earth because uh, of gravity, and it depends how the Earth would explode. Uh, does it crumple in place, or does it get flung out across the galaxy? If it got flung out across the galaxy, um, the moon would no longer have uh, anywhere to orbit, and therefore would also itself be flung out across the galaxy. But it would all, as a, as a clump, still to, uh, circle around the sun. Uh, where it is already in orbit. And inertia is very, very strong, uh, obviously. And therefore, we'd have... Uh, um, that's sort of a, a, a calamitous scenario we, we try not to think about too much, though. <laughs> but the moon, because it's orbiting the Earth, would, uh, would be in big trouble if the, uh, if the Earth were to, uh, were to explode. So there's a good example of somebody who still has an imagination. Very good question. Um, you, sir. Yep. Uh, what do you have to prepare for when you're coming back from space? What do you have to prepare for? So prepare for when you come back from space. I think uh, where this question leads me is to think about staying in shape in space. So if, if I were to send you to space today, and you were just floating around having fun like the minister was talking about for six months, like David's doing right now. He's working, but he's having fun. And if you didn't exercise in space, you would start, you would definitely lose your muscle mass. So you would be very weak when you came back. And you would also lose bone strength while you're up there because you're not using your body. 
So our bodies are kind of use it or lose it. And so in, in space, on the space station, we actually schedule David for two hours of exercise every day. He's doing the equivalent of weightlifting. It's a special machine that simulates weightlifting. He's running on a treadmill, and he's using a bike. And so what he's really preparing for is gravity. And he has to constantly stress his body, work his muscles. And that's kind of like you and I, even here on the planet. We know if we just sit around and watch TV and play video games and we never exercise or we're not active, that we're also not going to be in good shape. We're also long term, it's going to have long term impacts on our bodies. You might not feel anything today, and David wouldn't feel any, anything in space today, but if you don't take care of yourself, eat healthy, work out, you, there will be long term impacts on you. And those are things that we all need to be thinking about uh, right now. Thank you. Back here. Uh, the person with the white and black, that's you, yes. Sweater. Um, my question is, what's a specific planet you want to visit? Okay. Um. Well, me, personally, I would love to go to the moon. Uh, but I feel that's not a planet. <laughs> no, but I, I, no, no, but I feel the physical. So that's why I couldn't uh, go up there. But where would you guys want to go? Well, I, I've, I told you my inspiration was the moon. I remember the story I started with today was looking at a photo of a human standing on the moon. And I've always wanted to go on the moon and look up, and what would I see? If I was standing on the moon and I looked up into the sky, what would I see? Earth. I'd see Earth. And I always thought that would be such an incredible perspective to stand there and look back at our incredible planet. I think it would make me appreciate, it's like the Prime Minister was talking about earlier, it makes me, would make me appreciate uh, where we live. And uh, that's something I'd really like to do someday. So let me ask you a question, all of you. If, uh, if you had the opportunity to go to Mars, si on vous invitait à embarquer sur une mission pour aller à la planète Mars, en ce moment, ça prend six mois pour se rendre à la planète Mars, si on part au bon moment, et puis il faudrait rester là pour un certain temps, et puis encore un autre six mois pour revenir. Alors, peut-être que vous seriez parti deux ans, deux ans et demi de la planète Terre. Est-ce qu'il y en a qui aimeraient faire ça? Bon, ben c'est encourageant. Il y en a quand même beaucoup qui seront prêts à le faire. Excellent, excellent. OK. So who has a question? Somebody in the front row, there. So as you guys said before, you guys are like training to go in space. Um, and what exactly are you guys going to do in space? Well, we're going to explore, but we don't know exactly what we're going to be trying to find out yet. And that's really the nature of space exploration. I mean, we're doing these things to find out something new. And um, we don't know what we're going to find. But no matter what, we know it's going to be interesting. And we're going to do our best to use whatever we find to improve life here on Earth. And that's really the nature of space exploration. Uh, so we don't know what we're going to be doing yet. But what we discussed today, I mean, the idea of, of Canada committing to going to the moon on this gateway project, to orbiting the moon, um, those are the kind of missions that I'm really excited about. The idea of going someplace that will be new for, for our country to visit and the technologies we're going to develop to be able to survive there. I mean, on the International Space Station, it's been almost two decades of people living and working in space. That is a long time. And we're going to need new and different sort of technologies to keep us going around the moon. So uh, we don't know what we're going to be doing yet, but it's going to be pretty cool. If I may, yes, Mark, please. very quickly on that point. You know, there's a lot of science that's done, a lot of research that's done, but there's a lot of benefits here on Earth. And the Prime Minister alluded to this earlier as well. So this is cool. We're discovering new things. We're really excited about the unknowns. But what benefits have Canadians seen or people on Earth seen from all this exploration that's occurred so far on the International Space Station and other missions as well. How does this benefit people here on Earth? There are just so many examples of the way that space touches our life here on Earth. And it's almost better to think about it as an extension of our own planet. I mean, an extension of our presence. And the, the sort of technologies that we're developing so that we can live and work in space are things that we use here all the time. For example, we use space technologies in our communication. All of you who have phones, you're using space technologies without even knowing it. The computing power you have in your phones is there because it was a computing power we developed in the Apollo program. I mean, all of these ways in which we're exploring space 
affect us here. That's just one example. We can take another example. Let's think about how you get your food in the morning, how, how we observe our earth um, from this vantage point that space gives us has huge impacts for agriculture, how we grow and distribute food across our country. Uh, let's think about medical applications. The way astronauts, a, um, uh, the way Jeremy was speaking about our, our muscle and bone loss on the space station, I mean, that's not dissimilar to what happens with older populations as, as they age. And we're learning about that and learning how to improve people's lives here. I think those are all really great examples about just how our space exploration affects life here. You, and you know, that's one of the reasons we made this commitment today is because we see as Canadians, it's our number one goal as Canadians is what the Prime Minister was talking about. His vision for the country is about valuing people and taking care of people and having a strong society. That's our goal. So we didn't, our number one goal was not to get out to the moon, but we, what we realized is that by setting a big goal going to the moon, there are some similarities that we have on Earth like delivering health care at a great distance in the north or in isolated communities is the same problem that we're facing as we go out in the solar system. Or like Jenny was just talking about, the food. If we're going to go and colonize the moon or Mars, we're going to have to grow food there. And we're also realizing as our population grows in Canada, as we have climate change, we have challenges to growing food in isolated places in the north. It's the same challenge we have in space. That's really why we're doing it. And these are the things that we can learn on the International Space Station. We're learning them right now. And we're going to learn them out in new things out in deep space. That's the whole point. Remember what the PM said about finding a reason to, or a way to contribute. That's what we all feel like we're doing here. It's not a joy ride. It's a, it's a passion to make our country and our planet better. Thank you. Uh, the young lady in white at the back. How much time did did you did it take to for you guys to become an astronaut? Yeah, well, twenty seven ish years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I again I had this I had this interest when I was when I was really young. Like I just thought space was the coolest thing to explore, and I I sort of always wanted to be a a scientist. I, I love the idea of finding out something new, something that wasn't even written in, in a book yet. Like that's what that's what science and research, research gives us. I mean, you're when you become a scientist and you observe something, there's a chance that no one has ever seen that before. You're the first person ever to see this phenomenon, and it's up to you to share it with people. And that's what I thought was like really cool about fire. I mean, fire is something we've been using as humans for like our entire existence but we still don't know so much about it. Isn't that a cool idea? Like, I thought that was amazing. How have we been using that this long? And we don't, we, there's still questions we can't answer. Um, so, I mean, my path kind of led me in that direction, but, and all, I mean, all the skills that I developed as a scientist and an engineer, as a researcher, that is what led me on this, this path. But there are, it'll, it'll vary for everyone. I mean, how long did it take you to become an astronaut? I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> But, th but that's also part of the point about what Jeremy was saying about the price coming down. I mean, we now have something that you know, only a very few countries, and it took the entire government to focus on getting uh, a rocket or a person into space. Um, now we have private companies that are starting to send people into space. And you know, before, you had to be a very specific kind of maybe a fighter pilot with scientist training that was able to do all sorts of different things. Now we get more and more people who have skills as we go up to space more regularly, as we discover, as we ask more questions like what kind of, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of, you know, Physical training? Do we need? How do we optimize? You, know, you might have a physical trainer on 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 uh, in space. You might have uh, you know people who who you you only imagine uh, their jobs as being earthbound. Eventually, some innovation or some new discovery or some new path taken means that uh, something that you know a, a great chef is suddenly needed in space where nobody ever thinks about other thing other than you know boiling a freeze-dried packet of food to, uh, uh, to eat. I mean, there are so many more different paths that are going to open up in the coming decades into space that the paths that those of you who will end up astronauts, because I'm sure there's some of you in this room, 
um, will take will probably be totally different from the path uh, that Mark and Roberta and some of our first astronauts took, uh, that uh, Jeremy and Josh and Jenny and others are taking now. Every decade, there's a totally new way of looking at it. And what matters for each of you in terms of thinking about this as being one of the potential paths you could take is be curious, be interested, work hard, push yourselves. Because you know, for the rest of our lifetimes, one day it might be really easy, but the rest of our lifetimes, going to space, including your lifetimes, going to space is probably still going to be a pretty big deal. And if you're going to want to do that, you're going to have to be really good at something or other, really good at different things in order to get there. And that's sort of a challenge that, you know, the advantage of that is if you focus on being really good at different things that you're passionate about, you know, whether it ends up in space or not, you have a better chance of, you know, finding your dreams, of uh, responding to your passions, and of building a pretty amazing life for yourselves in the unknown of the future that we're building together. And let me tell you, all of you are capable of doing more than you think than you can do, really. And that's what you have to really go for. Il y a une jeune demoiselle en bleu qui a sa main levée depuis très longtemps. OK. Um, I think uh, people are really shy. Je poser la question en français. OK. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, je pense que les gens sont pas mal... Uh, gênée de poser cette question-là, mais je pense que tout le monde pose la question. Vous savez comment l'eau a flotte dans l'espace, alors comment vous faites pour faire vos besoins? So we have to replace gravity with something. So we simply replace it with airflow. So for urine, we just basically use a vacuum tube. And we have something that we just urinate into. And the airflow pulls it in like a vacuum. And we separate it. And then um, for a bowel movement, we just have something that looks a lot like a toilet. Uh, but it has airflow pulling things away from your body. And then uh, it's kind of like a, well, you guys probably don't know what a diaper genie is unless you've got younger siblings, but it's kind of like a <laughs> diaper genie for space. And then that stuff just gets packaged away, and then we just collect it. And when our cargo vehicles leave the space station, um, that's how we get rid of that stuff. But here's something cool. So the urine that we collect and we separate, we recycle it, and we drink it over and over and over again. So we filter it. It's perfectly clean water. I know it's super gross, <laughs> which is why all of you just suddenly started listening. <laughs> but it's super clean water, and we, we call it yesterday's coffee today, and we just, we just drink it over and over again. And so recycling for us on the International Space Station is super important, and getting us ready to go into deeper space, recycling is a really important uh, aspect of that. Other things we do, uh, we recycle our carbon dioxide back into oxygen. Um, we have 3D printing we're developing on board the International Space Station right now. So in the future, we won't have to bring all our spare parts or even all the tools. When we need one, we'll print it. And when we're done with it, we'll melt it and we'll print something else with it. And that's going to save us a lot of mass and waste. We won't have all the trash like we have today. Are those solutions you think might be valuable on the planet? Thank you for sharing that with us, Jeremy. Um, girl in the back. Um, okay, okay. Are you ever afraid that something bad might happen while you're in outer space? And if yes, like, what is it? Jenny, do you want to give that a go? Um, I, I expect I'll have moments of fear. I've had moments of fear uh, in my career as a pilot, for example. I've had moments where I felt like, whoa, that was really close. Uh, moments where I thought, this is really dire right now, and I'm going to have to create a solution. I'm going to have to lean on my training. Um, I've had, I had an incident in that big pool I talked to you about where we had a problem with my spacesuit, and uh, it didn't last very long, but there were a few moments there where it was like, I'm not sure that I'm not going to get hurt really bad here. Uh, by what's going on. And so I, I suspect I'll run into those situations of fear uh, in space as well. I feel like I'm well trained for them. But more than that, I feel like I have this really great team that has thought about a lot of things. We have a lot of great ideas and, and support. And so while I think I will get scared, I know that in that moment of fear, I have learned to just put the emotion aside, solve the problem, 
and then I can be scared about it after, if that makes sense. That's kind of how it works if you want to live. I, I, I remember, I'm sure this has been said by a lot of people, but it was, I think it was Chris Hadfield I heard say it first. He said, Jeremy, there are very few situations that you can't make worse. And uh, so when you're in a bad situation, you got, it's best to just kind of stop, solve it, and then you can think about it later. I'll, I'll that, that was originally Hoot Gibson. Was it? But uh, beforehand, yeah. I'll also add another um, thing that we think about a lot in our training, and that's that you know, we, we don't really train for, I mean, a normal day in space. We put so much effort into situations where something is off. Maybe something's gone wrong, and there's an action to be taken to take care of yourself, take care of your team, or take care of the vehicle that you're on. Um, so a lot of our our training really circles around those contingency situations. So even though there's there's risk and, and, and some fear, our training is pretty good. And like Jeremy said, we have that team that's always thinking of the next step, what's happening next, what can we do to make it better? But And, and you have to remember something as well. I mean, what both Jeremy and Jenny are talking about is managing that fear. And being brave, being courageous, doesn't mean not being scared. It means not letting that fear completely immobilize and control you. Something bad's happening, it's okay, you're gonna be scared. But can you do the thing or counter the thing that scares you anyway? Can you think calmly and focus through it? So someone who's never afraid doesn't get to be brave or, brave or courageous. It's only when you do have moments of fear and figure out how to get through it that you actually develop your courage and your bravery. And that is exactly what our astronauts are unbelievably good at. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if when you're um, in space, do you ever miss something in particular that's on Earth? Uh, well, I was only up in space for 10 days at most on my mission, so it was like going on a trip. So I didn't have really a chance to miss. But I have talked to Chris Hatfield, and I've talked to Bob Thursk, and I've talked uh, to other astronauts who have gone into space for a long time. And what you miss, first and foremost, is your family, because you're not, uh, you're not close to them. You can't touch them. Uh, although today you can talk to them every day from space and you can Skype with them. The second thing are the things that we are familiar with on Earth. Um, this may not sound, this may sound weird, but the smell of grass, the sound of a waterfall, rustling of tree leaves, these are things that are part of our experience here on Earth which we may not pay much attention to. But when you're up there in this very uh, closed system and you're looking down at Earth, you miss those things because we are all Earthlings. We all come from planet Earth and those things uh, are things that we think about when we're up there. Uh, okay, let's have another question. Um, in black. So I was just wondering, like, on the International Space Station, would it ever be possible to have gravity, like, so you can just walk in? Yeah, it is possible. In fact, one of the original designs for a space station included one of those kind of big rings. If you've ever seen the picture from like 2001 A Space Odyssey, and if you spin that big wheel on the outside of the wheel, um, you can have gravity. Have any of you been to like at a fair or on a ride that spins you around like a flying saucer and you're on the wall and it goes up and down? Same thing. So you could do that in space. The problem is it is a lot of mass. And mass makes space exploration difficult, costs more money, so that, and it's complex. That's why we didn't do it. But in the end, the fact that we didn't do it is how we're learning all these things about medicine and medical and how to overcome it and use those benefits back here in the plant. So it actually turned out better that we didn't figure out how to solve that problem. And now we're getting comfortable enough with microgravity that we believe on the way to Mars, on the long trip that the minister was talking about, we won't actually need to simulate gravity, we'll be able to do it without it. Le garçon avec le noué le t-shirt bleu. Should we colonize planets? Should we colonize planets? 
Well, that's a great policy question. I take the lead from the Prime Minister on this. I think uh, uh, he can maybe articulate his, uh, not only his uh, global vision, but like his uh, universal vision. <laughs> Humans haven't been along, around very long. Um, the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. Uh, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Um, to put that into perspective, if you imagine that the Earth, uh, you know, came into being you know, four and a half billion years ago uh, on January 1st, and we're now, right now, on New Year's Eve, December 31st at midnight. So for the entire existence of the Earth, humans only came into being about 20 minutes ago. And everything we've created, from pyramids to the discovery of writing to you know, everything more recently, only happened in the last few seconds. So in terms of the amount of time we've been around, uh, hasn't been very long. We've, you know, in this current form, we've been around for about 200,000 years. Uh, in, uh, in, in, with modern humans and writing and everything like that, maybe about 30 or 40,000 years if you really want to stretch it. Um, dinosaurs were around for about 150 million years. So we are only at the very, very beginning, if you look at it that way of what we're going to be able to do. And we've already done a pretty good job, unfortunately, of filling up the planet and of putting it under significant stress right now. If we manage to make it through and actually get into a sense of balance of you know, how to be sustainable as a life on this planet and not cause too many other you know, plants and animals to go extinct, and figure out how to make it through this century, and figure out how to make it a few more centuries into this, then absolutely, the work we're doing, exploring space, will probably bring us to set up colonies on Earth, uh, sorry, on the Moon, uh, on Mars, perhaps on, on some other planets. Um, in terms of getting outside of our solar system, uh, the nearest planet, what, is it Barnard Star? Is it Alpha, Alpha Centauri? One of the Alpha other, Centauri. Alpha Centauri. It's about 10, 12 light years away. So if you flash a beam of light, it takes 10 or 12 years to get there. Uh, that means that travel time to planets, even the nearest planets in our, uh, in our galaxy, uh, is going to be a matter of, because we can't travel at the speed of light, or certainly not faster than the speed of light like they do in science fiction shows and, and movies, uh, means it takes a huge amount of time, generations of people living and dying before you actually reach another planet. So it's possible. It's always there in stories and TV shows and movies. Uh, but in reality, it's a long way away. How far, how long will depend on the kinds of discoveries we end up making. But that's one of the reasons why, because we know it's going to take an awfully long time before we can successfully get human beings to live in a sustainable way other places. Because the moon, certainly, and probably Mars as well, even if we do set up, will be dependent on connections with the, with, with, uh, with the Earth. Means that for us to be able to make it long enough into the future to be able to think about settling other planets successfully, we're going to have to demonstrate that we can take care of this one properly and responsibly. Uh, and that's still something that we're having to work pretty, pretty hard on because you know, even just a matter of fighting climate change, people aren't, uh, people aren't all aware that this is something we're going to have to do and do the right way if we are going to continue to thrive through the coming decades and centuries. Jenny? I just wanted to add a, a cool thing that kind of came up in speaking about the idea of looking at colonizing an, another planet. If you, you think about kind of a creative way that, that humans could think about doing that, I mean... We just discussed today the idea of Canada going to the moon. Well, on the moon, we're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot about the technologies that we'll need to go elsewhere. But if you think about going to another planet, let's think about going to Mars. What about going to the moon first, the moon of Mars, or a moon of a different planet? And setting up an, an outpost there. I mean, if we know how to do it on our moon, maybe we'll know how to do it on that other moon. And moons are really interesting. They're really different. There are all sorts of cool moons in our solar system. There are ones that are covered with ice. There are ones that have like 
methane lakes. I, they, there's so many cool things to discover. So the idea of working with our moon to prove technology to move further, if we're going to look at colonizing planets, that's a pretty cool way to do it. That makes sense to me. Il faut dire que vous demandez des questions absolument excellentes. Alors, la personne qui est dans la quatrième rangée avec la main levée. Um, Oups. OK, bien, ça va. Oui, oui allez-y. Um, how many... Sorry, wait. Uh, can, you, can you use a phone in space? And also, um, how many... Like, how do you apply to be an astronaut? So two good questions there. All right. So she might want to go to space, but she wants to know if she can bring her phone. <laughs> so you can communicate pretty, um, pretty easily in space. You can't like have your phone with you, kind of as you know. But there are ways to communicate easily with your family and friends on the ground. First of all, there's a, a pretty much a constant link with uh, ground control. So you're always talking with someone who's part of a bigger team, who's. Uh, kind of telling you your plan to the day is always there, is, is really just part of your team, an extension of what you're doing up there. Um, and you can also call your family through the same sort of system. And there are a couple of different channels that we can use. So just today, we had a phone call from David, uh, one of our, our Canadian astronaut who's in space right now. And he called a cell phone, but he's not on like a cell phone up there in the same sort of way. And the second question was? How do you apply? How do you apply? So, you don't really apply like you would apply to any other job. I mean, I had a I had a job, a different job, a couple of years ago, and then the Canadian Space Agency said we're looking for new astronauts, and they sent out a call. There was some really cool stuff online about it, and my friend sent me a link and said, "Hey, have you thought about this in a while?" I thought, "Huh, that's really interesting." And then you apply the way you apply to any other job. Now the process after that gets a little bit different. Um, the, to, be, to train as an astronaut, there are a few things that you need. You need to be healthy. So they kind of look at that, whether you're healthy and you're, you're going to be able to fly in space. And they also look at um, different tasks that you can do, how resourceful you are, how you are under pressure especially. They really stress you out to see how you do, to see what would happen if you were in a difficult situation if you were in space. So after the initial application, then there's about a year of tests that you go through, and everyone's looking at you and see how you do. And then eventually, you can get the job. But it's just like applying for any other job at the beginning. I just want to add something. So are you interested? You want to be on our team? That's, that's cool. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> so here's a test for you. At the beginning, I was talking about what you need to do. And it was you need to set a, a goal, right? But then what did I tell you? What was the next most important part? And you just did it with us. That's it. Yeah. You're going to share it with others, what you just did. And now you're well on your way. And then the next thing you do is you start becoming the person you think you need to be to achieve that goal by getting help from other people. Jenny talked about needing to have, um, you know, you need to challenge yourself. You need academics. Uh, you're already doing academics. You're going to do your best in school. You're going to challenge yourself. So whenever you see something out there, you think, hmm, it'd be cool if I knew how to do that, but I'm a bit scared to do it. That's a challenge. Go take it. And the third thing you're going <laughs> you're gonna to do is you're going to be a good Canadian because we look for people. We don't want to be trapped in a tin can with someone who's not nice to be with. And we want to be trapped. Like, I want to be in a tin can with Jenny because I know she's going to take care of me. She's going to help me when I need help. So that's what we want to see out of you. And you can do that in your school right now. You can stand up and be brave against things like bullying and things. That's, those are the kinds of people that we're looking for. And you can start right now. You're already applying. Those are really good points. We have a chance for one last question. There is a young man there in purple who's had his arm up for a while. No, 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 no. And right there. Thank you. Otherwise, he'll be mad at me. <laughs> Okay, so my question is that if you if you think there is a chance of there being life on other planets, do you think we're going to get there first, or they're going to get to us first? And if they do get to us first, what do you think their first reaction is going to be? Anybody? Do you know the answer? <laughs> you continue on with your narrative. <laughs> well, I, it's it's a good question because it's, it's fun to think about because we absolutely do not know. We don't have any of that information to answer that question, which is why we're so curious to keep looking and exploring. And we'd like to know. It seems, it just seems odd to me. Like when I talked about how big the universe was, 
you just would kind of assume we're average, that there'd be people that are younger than, civilizations younger than us, and there'll be civilizations older than us with better technology. Now, that's assuming we're not the 100th percentile. Maybe we are the most advanced in the entire universe. That's also plausible. But probably, statistically, we would say we're probably somewhere in the middle, so it's more likely we would get visited first. But I just made that up. I never actually thought about it before. So <laughs> I don't know if that's, if that's accurate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, on a eu droit à des questions excellentes aujourd'hui, mais aussi à des réponses excellentes de la part du panel. Alors peut-être une main d'applaudissement pour notre équipe. Merci à vous tous d'avoir partagé votre temps avec nous aujourd'hui. Et c'est clair que vous avez tous des rêves, vous aussi. Et on espère tous que vous allez pouvoir réaliser vos rêves dans les années à venir. Merci encore. Thank you.